Okay. All right, so welcome back, everybody. This is Matt Feldman, which uh, today is uh, May 6th. Anybody else celebrate uh, May the 4th, Star Wars Day? We had a, we had a lot of fun. Um, yeah, in the years past, I actually scheduled a run with the group, um, the local running club, and uh, I ran in a full Darth Vader mask, uh, which is hard to breathe through, by the way. Uh, it's, it's a lot more difficult than you think. Anyway, so it's May 6th. The uh, topic today is uh, niche identification. It's one of the key things we talk about when we first start off our, our uh, sessions, uh, when we're doing it as a pre-conference workshop. Um, and it's one of those first things that you really want to kind of get your, your arms around when you're starting to think about what you want to do as an independent consultant. Um, I, you know, it's, it's, kind of, it's, it's, a, it's an important topic because where are you going to spend your time? What are you going to do? These are some of the books that I'm going to hit today. Um, I'd be very interested in uh, the chat se section if you want to share any other books. And I'll, I'll repeat these at the end of the presentation, but I'm going to be referencing these different books here. But when we're talking about our niche, we're, we're talking about a handful of different questions, like who do I want to serve? That's the key thing. Who are, who are, those, who are my clients or my potential clients? Which leads to what type of services do I offer? And I'm not going to be able to answer these questions for you. These really become uh, you know, an internal conversation that you're having. You're going to do some soul searching. You're going to think about who you are, what you like to do, who you want to serve. These things happen. And then so that will all di dictate how you're going to spend your time. But at the end of the day, what, I mean, really, why do you want to do this independent consulting thing? How did you find yourself here? What is the passion? What is the drive? It's, if it's just about money, is you're not going to survive in it. You've got to find a way to identify clients and things that you like to do that are, are that fill you up so that this is a sustainable process. I'm going to get into some, you know, uh, a bunch of Venn diagrams about that in a little bit. But I always start about and talk about Jim Collins' hedgehog concept, which uh, comes from his book, Good to Great. The hedgehog concept comes from, you know, a, a poem from, uh, or a, an essay from philosopher Isaiah Berlin, and he talks about the differences between a fox and a hedgehog. Now, um, despite what your, my, my son would tell me about Sonic the Hedgehog, hedgehogs are really not speedy little animals that play video games. They're small, they're kind of like por porcupines, you know, they move in a very determined manner. Um, they have very, they have a lot of focus in their life. Like they need to, they move from point A to point B with, with determination. Whereas a fox in this whole, in this whole idea, this uh, essay um, darts around kind of meaningless in a meaningless manner um, as the uh, reference to Greek poet Archilochus wrote, the fox knows many things, but the hedgehog knows one big thing. And that's the premise for what um, Jim Collins talks about in identifying your niche, identifying who you are and what you want to do. So he developed this hedgehog concept or, um, for his book, Good to Great. Ultimately, you're talking about the intersection of three ideas, doing what you love, the things that drive you, that you think about at night, that you get up, you can't wait to do. And for me, that is um, education. I enjoy um, my piece in supporting an educational venture um, helping um, our administrators understand why uh, we're having problems with educator shortage and getting to the bottom of some of those questions, um, facilitating teacher uh, professional development so they can be better at teaching math, finding ways to encourage students to uh, appreciate STEM careers so that they can go on and have an opportunity for some fantastic careers down the road. What I'm really good at is the next circle, that little orange circle. And so you, you not only have to be in love with what you, what you want to do, but you have to be good at it. And so for a lot of us, that is those kinds of skill sets of qualitative data analysis or um, reporting. Um, if you give me a, a, a really nasty data set, it's all, I can clean it up in a fairly quick manner and turn it into usable data. And uh, what our firm has become really good at is data visualization and dashboarding and those sorts of things. And so we are really good at analyzing and communicating data. And that's something that I personally embrace, but as, as it turns out, my firm is also becoming very well known for that. And what can you be paid for? Where, where's the money, right? So it's the intersection of these things. 
for us, I mean, I love civics education, but there's really not much in the world of civics education. It's really in the world of STEM. So we focus our attention where there's where we, we do what we love, where we can do things that we're really great at and what you can be paid for. And so you need to focus your attention on those three things. And this is where you're gonna do some soul searching. You're gonna think about who you are, what you wanna do, and ultimately that intersection of those three things. If you're not thinking about those three things and it's not serving all those three things, then it's not gonna be a sustainable venture. Um, you know, I, I think about the hopeless art student, somebody who loves art, but maybe is not gonna be one of the best people in the world at it. They're not, their opportunities for success are not gonna be there. So they won't be paid. They're not, they're gonna be over in one of either loving it, not good at it, or, or where there's no money, or they, they may, be, may be good at it, but they haven't found a way to, um, you know, generate funds for it. I also think about the corporate lawyer. That's somebody who gets paid really well. They're really good at it because they have a special skill set. but at a certain point, they don't love it anymore. Um, and I'm going to curse in a second. I apologize for this, but this is a real book called Bullshit Jobs. And the book basically uh, did an analysis of different careers and it finds out a lot of people really are unhappy with their work. The most unhappy and, and consequently uh, oftentimes most very well paid are corporate lawyers, right? Corporate lawyers do a, a job that probably they, they don't even not, they, they, they don't love anymore. They may actually loathe, uh, but they're really great at, they have a skill set and they get paid really well. And it just makes for a really terrible situation. You don't want to do that with your career. And actually you'll find um, there's a lot of a lot of people who are in this situation. Now, I've always talked about the hedgehog concept and I love it, but I can't help but think there's a, another approach. And I read this book recently called Kata Ikigai. And I know that sounds like a strange term. It is a Japanese term. And they, I, I wanna add a fourth piece in here. And I, I feel like I'm gonna switch the way I talk about niche identification because I think there's this fourth piece. So Ikigai, um, old, I, I don't know if I can even go into the, the details on it because I, I'm not that well prepared, but there, it's really a fourth piece is what the world means. And I think that that intersection of those four circles are what you wanna be thinking within, within regard to this, this Venn diagram. So it's what you love, what you're good at, where there's money, but really what the world means. I know that we as program evaluators, um, we get into this work oftentimes out of passion for the, the work Keep in the work with that of our clients and an interest in really doing something that contributes back to the world. Um, very rarely do you just find people who are all in it for, for um, their skill set and the money. You know, um, I don't know a lot of people. I, I, I hear people say this, but I'm not entirely convinced I believe them that they really love math. I think most of us love our skill sets because they can help us do things that can contribute to the world in really positive and fantastic ways. But at a certain point, a lot of us are doing what we do because we love the people that we're working with and we understand that we're a piece of a, of a bigger puzzle that's trying, that, we're, that we're trying to put together to really solve some of the world's problems. For me, it's in the world of education. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna start from now on talking about this hedgehog concept also from the purpose of Ikigai, which is those four ideas of doing what you love, doing something that you're really great at, which it can be paid for, as, and then adding in the idea of what the world means. If you can do that, you find your life's purpose, which becomes your niche, right? And think about that with regard to how you design and think about your, your niche, who you wanna serve at, in your independent consulting firm. So getting back to Collins, he talks about a flywheel concept. A flywheel is a mechanical device um, that helps your car run and keeps your car moving in the engine. I don't understand it. I mean, I really don't. Uh, but I do understand Ferris wheels. Um, and so when I think about this, I often think about um, the Ferris wheel. I, I met my wife in Chicago on Navy Pier. We would go and we would ride the Ferris wheel very romantic. We'd get to the top, we'd kiss. It'd be fantastic. Um, but think about that Ferris wheel as, a, um, as your business. And as it spins, that's an indicator of how well your business is going. And whatever metrics you want to use, oftentimes it may be, um, you know, sales or number of clients or impact. You define your own metric, but the, the the rate at which that that Ferris wheel spins is the indicator of how well you're meeting those metrics that matter to your business. 
So if you're focusing your attention like a hedgehog on that Ferris wheel and you reach up and you grab that Ferris wheel and you go to move it, that is you focusing on in on your niche. And so you'll start and uh, initially it will start to move very slowly. Maybe the first day you'll get it to move just a little bit. So this is just a visualization for how if we maintain focus on our, on our niche, our flywheel or our Ferris wheel in my situation continues to go a little bit faster. Now, um, using Colin's idea, if you're a fox, you're moving around and you're diving around and you're losing attention on, on where you're supposed to be focusing your attention. And so you're continuing to press and focus your attention like a hedgehog in the same direction on your ikigai or, or hedgehog concept and your Ferris wheel begins to go faster and faster. This is showing up every day, doing something you love and doing a fantastic job at it with people that you enjoy and doing something that the world needs. So I know everybody's about to have a headache. I'm sorry about that. So let's move on to the next thing. So that, that for me, a lot of times is where I end the lecture on niche. But I do think it's important for us to talk about evolving niche, particularly since we've got people on this call that have been doing what they're doing for a long time and they realize that niches change. And so you see on the left and the right kind of a, a changing focus. Um, truth is, if you're just getting started, your, your niche is kind of a blurry aspirational idea, but as you do it, you realize it changes, it develops, it grows. You change, um, your clients change, the funding world changes and you have to adapt. And you begin to understand better and better what you're you're meant to do. But so now getting into Michael Michalowicz's ideas, he says the big not so secret secret to finding your niche is being really, really good at very, very little. The key here is that you need to find those ideas as you get into your career, as you get into your independent consulting practice, find those people that you enjoy working with. Find those things that you're really great at where there's real opportunities and do that, right? And, and as you find the people that you don't enjoy working with, stop doing that. Focus on being really great at very, very little, meaning you have kind of cornered the market. There's a bit of, uh, you know, give and take on this, but um, you need to, this is, this is effectively, go find your niche, right? Be good at something that um, nobody else really has cornered the market on. So he has uh, what he calls the toilet paper entrepreneur or PPE focus five. Um, and this is another way to think about how to narrow your ideas around your niche. So if you narrow your focus, you can have an increased ability to be the best. So the way I initially narrowed my focus was I'm in Southwestern Illinois. I didn't cross the Mississippi River, which is 20 miles to the west of me right now. Um, I focused entirely on Southwestern Illinois, which is kind of a crazy idea because there's a lot of opportunities out there. But I realized if I got to know people in my community in, in a hundred mile radius of where I am right now, they know each other. And as opportunities pop up, they will communicate and I'll be able to speak a language of being local. And, um, and, 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 and that, that should be self-sustaining. Um, so that's the narrower focus that I've used. And a narrower focus reduces competition because I can claim to be your local evaluator. Like I can come and I can meet you for a cup of coffee um, tomorrow. Whereas, uh, you know, Gavani, who's probably 10 times better than me at what she does and her firm is fantastic. They can't come out and meet somebody in, um, you know, Belleville, Illinois on a, on a moment's notice the way I can. Um, so that's where I have a better a better ability to meet, to meet my clients. So I focused um, initially on Southwestern Illinois um, and I reduced my competition by being their local evaluator. Now, this is where it gets complicated. And this is something you need to think about as you're doing your own self searching ideas, but that narrow focus creates a smaller customer base, right? So is there enough in Southwestern Illinois for me to be able to sustain myself? Um, and that is a limitation with this, with this idea of narrowing your focus. And a lower focus also creates lower potential revenue because I'm not reaching out as far as I could. 
and also I have slower growth. So this really becomes a balancing issue, right? On one end, you want to be, you want to limit your, you want to narrow your focus so that you can be the best and reduce your competition. But that also causes on the other end, a smaller customer base, lower potential growth and, and uh, lower potential revenue and slower growth. So how do you find it? I don't know. I mean, I'm not going to tell you guys the answer. I mean, talk to your friends, talk to your colleagues, get involved with office hours, chat this up, think about it, write it down, journal, whatever it takes for you. But at the end of the day, you need to figure out how you balance these things against one another. Because what happened to me was um, I got a project in Scuda, which is uh, 25 miles from me, going um, south, uh, south of here. And it's uh, for the Department of Defense. And um, you know we were just focusing on the scooter and we were able to branch out and do another project in the next community over in Ohio. Um, fantastic opportunities. But what happened was I realized I can replicate this work in Rhode Island and North Dakota. And, I, and the, the customer experience, uh, my involvement with them is about the same. Um, I love the idea of being able to get in my car and drive over to the scooter and have a cup of coffee with Laura to talk about her project. But another thing happened, um, which is a disadvantage for a lot of people, but for a lot of us independent evaluators, it was a real advantage. Everybody learned to use Zoom, um, which I know what like, Zoom fatigue is a real thing. We've all heard it. But the reality is I can communicate just as effectively or nearly. Well, I, honestly, if I can't go see my clients, I, I, I can communicate with somebody 20 miles away from me, just as well as I can 2,000 miles away from me, because it's all the same. The, the field has been leveled. So I've been able to grow my projects and grow my opportunity to serve people through the, the communication mechanisms that have been made available to us. So what you're doing is you're effectively thinking about, should you narrow your focus or broaden your focus? And there's no right answer for this. There's no exact way to know about it. I'm going, to, I'm going to branch into a whole other idea. And I think this is something we talked about. I know we talked about it in October. It's the same slide. I'm going to bring it up again because I know a lot of you weren't there. Um, as we uh, are thinking about who we are and we're thinking about what we want to do, who we want to serve, what kind of how we want to spend our time, you eventually are going to find yourself in one of these three areas of innovation. How are you going to compete? Are you going to compete on price? A lot of us start by competing on price and we find that's probably a bad way to go because we're not getting paid the right amount. We're not gonna be able to make enough money to make this really worth our while. If you're charging $60 an hour or less, I forbid, you're probably not going to make enough money um, to make this, make this worthwhile. Um, I've shared before, and this is in the journal article, the median um, hourly rate for um, evaluators is $100 per hour. So I'm not saying you should use that. You should go through, watch the videos, go through the exercise that we talk about on how to identify your rate. But what I'm saying is um, a lot of us start by competing on price, which means the lower price means you can, you can have the project. Those are actually not great clients to have either, by the way. If clients are asking you how low you're going to go, um, then they're, they're going to be difficult and you're not going to want to work with them for a long time and you're not going to be happy. You're not gonna, that's not going to fit within your Venn diagram of who you want to work with. Now, it's an interesting thing. Most of us, uh, oh, I love it. Gamani says, yes, 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 I love it. Race to the bottom, don't compete on price. Um, I had this exact situation, a quick aside, where I had a client kind of reach out to me out of the blue and um, she asked me to bid out the, a bunch of work. It was uh, about $30,000 of work. And um, she came back and she says, but I only have $18,000. And I said, well, I think we can probably do something for $18,000. And I started removing tasks. I said, I can't do this and I can't do this, but for $18,000, you can have this reduced project. And you know, she says, but I really want everything. And I said, well, everything will cost $30,000. And the key here um, is when people want to debate on price, that's fine. You start removing tasks, you start, you start removing time on activities. You don't just lower your price because you really want the project. That's, that's a race to the bottom, as Bamani put out. Most of us, I would say, um, particularly uh, one, one people shops, we get really good at what we do. We find people that we like and we compete on quality. The quality meaning I can do a fantastic job for you because I know you, I know, your, I know who you're trying to serve, I know your funders, 
Um, I know how to write these reports. We work well together. You're not going to beat my quality because we have this fantastic relationship. Now, I think this is less the, the case for um, independent one person shops, but as you work into the third piece, and I actually think of this as a, as a, as a movement from left to right, because we start at price, we learn that's a bad idea. Most of us live in the quality world. And I think quality never really goes away in the, in the independent evaluation ideas. But um, we, when we get more than one person in our shop and we bring people in, when we start to have grad students, when we start to have staff, we start actually competing on convenience because we as operations need to find ways to replicate what we're doing. Um, I've learned how to develop a survey that, um, and I understand the principles of my survey. I need to be able to replicate that so a grad student can manage this. Um, and hypothetically, at some point, they can, they can manage it from start to finish. And they don't need me to do a whole lot of interaction with them. That becomes the convenience speech feature. Because now I can, serve, I, can do, I can offer more services to my clients, and I can serve more clients. It's not about how many hours in a day can Matt Feldman serve these folks. It's how many, how many different services we can provide to our clients. And that becomes the word of convenience. So. Uh, Anyway, that's a little bit of a side, but that's another thing that you want to think about as you're identifying your business. I think you could probably make an argument that this isn't niche, but I don't know where else to stick it. I just love this conversation. So getting into Michael McAllowitz's idea on pumpkin farming. I know that sounded like a strange transition, didn't it? This is, trust me, you just got to follow me on this. He has this strange connection between the idea of being a successful business that can replicate what you do, and this does fit with Mitch, and being a pumpkin farmer. So just follow me, just, just stick with me on this. Don't give up on me just yet. So if you're a pumpkin farmer, you need to do a couple of things. You can start to draw the connections on your own. We're gonna, we're, I'm gonna make this more, uh, I'm gonna interpret this for you in a second. If you're a pumpkin farmer, you need to plant, plant the right seeds. Now, pumpkin farmers who are, have these great giant pumpkins that compete at the county and the state fairs, they don't plant just any pumpkin seed that you pick up at Lowe's or Home Depot. They buy special ones, and they're often hundreds of dollars per seed. So you need to plant the right seed. You need to plant several of them, and you need to focus on each of those seeds. You need to water them. You need to fertilize them. You need to do all those other you know, farmer things, right? I should know. My last name is Feldman, which interpreted in German means farmer. And my grandparents were farmers, but uh, I don't know if I know much about pumpkin farming. As, as you're, you're focusing on this, you need to remove those small pumpkins that didn't work. They're sucking up soil, they're sucking up energy, they're sucking up water from the other pumpkins that are very successful, that are, that are growing beautifully, that have the nice round forms that are turning the right color. Um, because you can't have all those seeds, they're taking too much, too much of the revenue of, of the resources away from the other pumpkins. You need to weed like crazy. Pull all those distractions out of the way of the pumpkin you're trying to grow. Get rid of those other less promising pumpkins and then spend time nurturing that pumpkin. If, it's, if you see a freeze coming, you need to be out there covering it. You need to make sure it's not affected by the freeze. Then you need to watch that pumpkin grow to a giant size. Remember to socialize with the other pumpkin farmers so you know what's going on. All right, so let's interpret this. When you if you are going to be an independent consultant, you're going to focus on your niche. You're going to think about the intersection of those four circles and that Venn diagram I was talking about. That's focusing in on your strengths. You know who you are. You know what you're great at. You know what you enjoy. You know where there's opportunities for clients to work with. And you know what you want to contribute back to the world and what the world needs. That intersection, if you're focusing in on that, you're focusing on your strengths and you're keying in on your area of innovation. At a certain point, you're gonna realize there's rotten clients out there and they're sucking up your energy. Those are like weeds. They are, um, if you've been focusing on your good clients, the ones that are paying you well, that you enjoy working with, that pay their bills on time, um, they're, you're, they're going to sustain you. In fact, they're gonna grow. You're, you're, they're gonna grow your pumpkin. Your pumpkin in this situation is like that Ferris wheel. The bigger it grows, the healthier it is. That's, the, that's your metrics for how successful your business. So at a certain point, identifying on your top clients and focus on them, right? If 
to the extent that you can, stop serving those other clients. Those projects end, don't renew them. I know this is a scary idea, but this is focusing in on your niche, identifying those top clients, focus on them because they're gonna grow more opportunities for you in the future. You're gonna be happier, you're gonna be sustaining. Those other ones that are drawing your, your energy and your attention that don't pay on time, that insist on paying you, you know, half of what you, that you have to fight that battle for, for how much you're gonna get paid in fees. They're, they're not sustainable. And you shouldn't be focusing on them. And then watch your business grow, but also remember to come back and connect with your other, your other um, independent consultants, the IC TIG and other kinds of venues like this, I, these IC topic chats. So um, with that, that's the end of the little session on this. As a reminder, here's the four books that we uh, that I was referencing. I kind of like Michael McCallow. It's a, a something that came out in the um, e whatever it's called, the, like the listserv that comes out. What are some books? I never expected to like Michael McCallow's McCallow's work, but uh, and it it's crass. He's crass. I mean, he talks about toilet paper and he goes into more detail than you want to think about with toilet paper. Um, but he uses that as his, uh, his way of talking about um, how to be in a successful business. It's, it's an interesting book. And the Pumpkin Plan really should be read after Toilet Paper. You know, Good to Great is one of the, the uh, best business books. I think it's the number one business book of all time by Jim Collins. And How to Ikigai Guy um, was, a, was a kind of a fun read. Um, it's probably not the best book on Ikigai, Guy, this uh, Japanese principle of, uh, you know, how to identify your 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 purpose, but it's certainly a good one to think about for understanding your niche. And as I said, we meet every Thursday at um, noon Eastern, and we are booked up. Can you believe it? We're booked up through July fifteenth. I just Lisa at Lisa K just uh, emailed me this morning and said she wants uh, July fifteenth. So we're gonna be focusing on that. And I think the week after that, I want to put together a session on growing things. So, and watch out. I think we're going to have a conversation there. So with that, I'll, I'll stop the recording and um, we'll jump into the chat portion. Feel free to turn on your videos and join us.